Today's guest literally needs no introduction, and I am so excited to have had the opportunity to speak with her and bring her knowledge to you today. Even though she needs no introduction, of course, that's what I'm here for. I'm going to do it. Who am I talking to today? Oh my gosh, drum roll, please. Today's guest is none other than Dr. Judy Morgan herself. I know you know who she is. If you don't, well, I'm about to tell you. Dr. Judy Morgan has over 38 years experience as an integrative veterinarian, acupuncturist, chiropractor, food therapist, she is a best-selling author. She speaks internationally. She has her own podcast, and she owns Dr. Judy Morgan's Naturally Healthy Pets, which is, by the way, not only an incredible resource for finding supplements for your pet, but also the blogs, the information, the everything is top-notch. It is one of the best places to go to find information to help raise your pets more naturally or holistically or even integratively because let's be honest there is room for all of it so today dr judy sits down with me and we are talking about tcvm traditional chinese veterinary medicine there was one question in particular that was just burning in my brain. I tracked her down at AHVMA, the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association Conference in 2023. And I said, please come on my show and address this question because it's driving me bananas and I need to get it on the record. And she said, uh, yeah, we need to talk about that. So stay tuned because this entire episode, you do not want to miss. And that just how happens to be the last question I ask her, but that's just how it all worked out. So make sure to stick around to the end. What is that question and what is her answer? Oh my goodness. If I have this question, I know you have this question too. So please, please welcome Dr. Judy Morgan to the Pet Parenting Reset. <coughs> Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. So thank you for being sure. here sure. Um, and, and for recording with me. So Dr. Judy, you um, are, I, I don't, in my opinion, you, you're very, you're one of, if not the top, like most famous vet on social media these days, which is incredible. Um, what well, you're we're doing. getting hate mail today, but you know, <laughs> it happens, right? <laughs> You go after a big, big company and you get hate mail. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, yeah. And the bigger you are, the more hate mail you get, right? Uh -huh. Fortunately, um, you know, you, you do have a team of people who can kind of handle some of those nasty comments online and, and maybe insulate <laughs> yes. you from those because those can be pretty bad too. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But um, uh, what I like specifically about the information that you put out, not just that you're more holistically minded, but you also have this um, background of TCVM. And I, I don't think everybody knows what that is. So I th I'd like to start out with TCM, TCVM, if you can kind of just give a quick overview of what that is. What, th what, do what does it mean when we say that? <laughs> Okay, so TCM is traditional Chinese medicine and TCVM is traditional Chinese veterinary medicine. And from the veterinary medicine standpoint, there are four branches of TCVM. The one that most people are most familiar with is acupuncture because that is almost considered mainstream at this point. Many veterinary offices have an acupuncturist. They may not really be a holistic vet, um, holistic veterinarian in like, the big realm, but they do acupuncture. Unfortunately, a lot of times that acupuncture is being done more from a uh, Western-minded 
application than an Eastern-minded application. So, But still, acupuncture is something that is pretty mainstream at this point. Next, we have herbal medicine. And so we have herbal medicine in a lot of different backgrounds. So we have Ayurveda, for, which is Indian, and then we have uh, Western herbal medicine, and then we have Chinese herbal medicine. So that's another main branch. And then the third one is something called Tui Na, which is sort of a massage spinal manipulation combo, but it's a lot of different movements on different areas of the body, depending on what kind of effect you want to to bring about, uh, which is very cool because it's something that we can teach pet owners to do at home. Uh, so it gives the owner uh, some power to make changes. Um, and then the fourth branch is food therapy. And uh, when I started studying traditional Chinese veterinary medicine, we all start with acupuncture and we move through the different branches. And when I hit food therapy, that was where I got off the bus and said, I'm stopping right here. I love this food. It, and, and every holistic veterinarian that you talk to, you will find that they have that one thing that just they got stuck on and said, this is, this is my thing. Um, Melissa Shelton, the oily vet, she does all essential oils. Uh, many of the holistic veterinarians love homeopathy. I, for me, I think it's a really cool science. I love it, but I don't do it. <laughs> I don't want to study it. It doesn't, it doesn't sing to me. So, so food therapy is really where I start everything. Um, one of my favorite sayings is that you cannot out supplement a bad diet. So if you are feeding your pet a really poor quality diet, or if you yourself are eating a very poor quality diet, I don't care how many little pills and capsules and powders you take or give your pet, you're not going to solve problems if you don't give the body a good foundation. And that foundation, the building blocks are food. Yeah, absolutely. I, that's kind of the foundation of this podcast too, is, is <laughs> bringing on with everybody that I bring on. It's, it all starts with food. It all starts with what we're fueling the body with. And yep. the more and more I learn, the more and more I get to talk to people and interview people. And uh, it, it's, it is, there's so much about food and not just food, but then there are different foods that we can use to do different things in the body, which I know, exactly. you know we can maybe touch on in a few minutes. Not that you're going to be able to give a master class today, but <laughs> <laughs> there is, it's more than just put good in, get good out. Like that's a really great foundation, but yep. the food therapy specifically, when we talk about uh, traditional Chinese veterinary medicine or even traditional Chinese medicine, there are certain foods that we can use for certain things, which is just absolutely. fascinates me. It's absolutely yep. fascinating. And you kind of touched on it a little bit, but there is a huge difference in what you do or did <laughs> as a TCVM vet versus what somebody going into a traditional veterinary medicine office in the like the United States. That's where we are. So that's what I talk about. Um, we'll see. And even if, and you you kind of have already touched on this as well, even if you go to a veterinarian's office and they're like, we're holistic because they do acupuncture, there's so many things that they still may not do that right. somebody like you would would do. Can you touch on that a little bit? Like just the differences so people walking into an office can be like, this isn't what I thought it was. Exactly. So. Um one of the biggest holistic group in the US is the AHVMA, the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association. And so AHVMA.org is the website for them. And you can go there and click on the find a veterinarian if you are looking for a holistic veterinarian. And under, so you put in your state and then you look at where people are located and then it'll tell you what they do. And so anyone can join the AHVMA. You can be a traditional vet and join the AHVMA if you just want to be a member and learn whatever. Um, so you may pick somebody off that list and it says they do acupuncture or they do chiropractic or whatever it says they do on there. 
uh, and then when you walk in the office, and I've had this happen, uh, I have a great story from a client in Ohio. She was looking for a holistic veterinarian. So she went on the website and she found this holistic veterinarian. She walked into the practice. And when she got into the waiting room and checked in at the reception desk, there were bags and bags and boxes and boxes and cans and cans of prescription diets lining the walls. And she went, oh, no. And then in their display case in front of the receptionist, there's all these flea and tick chemicals and heartworm preventative, like all these different chemicals and things. And she just, you know, oh my gosh, I'm in the wrong place. I can't, I can't bring my animal here. I'm looking for a holistic veterinarian. And she thought, well, I made the appointment. I'm here. I drove an hour to get here. I'm going to meet the veterinarian. And so she went in the veter into the office, and when the veterinarian came in, she said, I I'm sorry, I think I'm in the wrong place because I don't do any of those things that I saw out in the waiting room. And the veterinarian laughed, and she said, well, yes, this is a traditional practice. I happen to be a holistic practitioner within a holistic or within a traditional practice. So the owner thought, well, I'm going to see, like, you know, is she going to start recommending this stuff that's out front, even though she can do acupuncture and whatever else. And so the owner had brought her bag with her, with her supplements. And she also had in the bag, my first book from needles to natural. And so she pulled the book out and she said, look, I follow this lady online. And the veterinarian started cracking up. She said, I'll be right back. And she ran out of the room and she came back in with the same book. And so then the owner said, okay, I'm in the right place. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes what you see up front may not be what you get in the exam room. On the other hand, you may be there to meet a holistic practitioner who practices acupuncture or maybe does some spinal manipulation. But then at the end of the conversation, you're being told, well, your pet is not up to date on this vaccine, this vaccine, you need to have this and this, and we need to, you know, get on a flea and tick chemical. And I would recommend this big name brand pet food. That's when you say, okay, we're going to part ways because, or you say, can we work together because I'm, I'm not going to do all of those things. So can we still work together? I'd like to have, you know, acupuncture or whatever the other thing is that you're there for, but you know, this is, this is where I'm going to draw my line in the sand. So you can find veterinarians. Like I do not have a license to practice in North Carolina since I retired. So I take my animals to another veterinarian who is traditional. And when I walked in, she didn't know who I was. I walked in, I had my stack of books and a bunch of animals with me. And I said, I'm just going to tell you right off. I'm a retired veterinarian. And she went, huh? And I said, and we feed raw and we don't vaccinate. And she went, huh. I said, you okay with all that? She said, sure, you do you. And I went, we're good. So uh, she's really interesting because when on their new client intake forms, it asks the referral source. And so I've done lives with her and talked about her a lot. And so some local people have gone there on my recommendation. And if, if on the client intake form, it says that I was the referral source, the staff has a totally different conversation with those clients than they do with anybody else just walking in because they know that those people have a different set of rules. And if you can find a traditional veterinarian who is willing to allow you to have your different set of rules, then it can work fine. <laughs> no, and that's important to to talk about um, because there, there just aren't that many. When we think about the population of the United States and the fact that really yeah, we don't have enough veterinarians. The problems of being a woman. Um, the, the, the fact that we just don't have enough veterinarians period. And then this right. really, really small percentage that are truly holistic are just so hard to come by that we we yep. do need to be able to have these conversations. I was I just recorded exactly. yesterday with Dr. Kozier and we were having the same conversation that we have, we have to be able to talk like we're both humans to one another and have conversations and not come, come well, into that's true. the room and with a wall up. Right. A lot of, exactly. And a lot of that is on, on the client, um, not, getting your veterinarian in a defensive position, not backing them into a corner, being able to have a conversation, um, a respectful conversation and say, look, I, you know, I know this is like, 
my technicians, when somebody would come in the room, like they were the ones who would bring them in and they would have the conversation with them. And they had, they had a whole list of things that they had to go through. And that included, you know, this is the last time your pet had vaccines, uh, and then talk about their lifestyle for boarding, grooming, daycare. Do you have requirements? Um, and then asking them if they're using any flea and tick prevention or any heartworm prevention. And that's just part of the conversation of, you know, they're due for this lab work. Uh, if, if you're following traditional, uh, medicine, this is when we would say this vaccination is due. And so my, my, my staff had to have that same conversation with every person that walked in, but it was a conversation just to get answers and find out where the client was on that spectrum of, you know, which vaccines they needed. Um, and so a lot of clients would say, look, I know you have to go through this whole thing. I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm not doing any vaccines. I want a tighter. I'm not doing these chemicals. And, you know, so it's great. It's just, it's having that conversation in a respectful way. And, you know, if you go to a traditional practice and the technician or the doctor comes in and says, your pet is due for all this laundry list of things, you have the option of respectfully saying, yeah, I don't, I don't do those chemicals. And um, yeah, I don't want to over vaccinate. I don't think we have a risk for that. I'm well educated on it. It's okay. Uh, I'm taking responsibility for that. So you can just check you know, declined by that box. Thank you very much. I appreciate your knowledge. Um, and you know, that how can they get mad? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I, I just, I don't think that's a conversation we can have enough. Um, because yeah. it's sure. just something we need to remind ourselves of all the time <laughs> to, yeah. to do that. So you, you talked to and, and we just, we just covered that there are very few truly holistic veterinarians based on, you know, the number of people that are actually in, let's just say the United States. And even in that category, they're not all TCVM vets. So that's an even smaller. Oh, right. right. Cause holistic uh, is a, very broad category. So you can be a holistic veterinarian who only practices chiropractic or only practices acupuncture, um, or only practices homeopathy. Um, so TCVM is just one of many, many modalities that can, can be considered holistic or complementary, whatever you want to call it. Right. And it is not some, new age hippie thing. This is very, this is like ancient <laughs> wisdom that we're bringing in. It is ancient. <laughs> Thousands of years of knowledge. Um, and it's really interesting because uh, animals were so important to be able to do work. So the oxen to, you know, carry things and horses as transportation and uh, sheep to provide milk and, you know, chickens to provide eggs and those things. So thousands of years ago, it was really important to keep these animals healthy. So traditional Chinese medicine has literally been around for thousands of years being utilized on animals as well as people. So I, I guess I, I say that to say that, you know, if, if somebody is just hearing about this for the first time going, oh, these crazy <laughs> holistic people, it's not. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, uh, when uh, when I bought my first veterinary clinic, I had a partner and we, he had a traditional veterinary clinic and I was very traditional at the time. And we bought this satellite clinic and it was owned by a homeopathic veterinarian. And so we used to make fun of him and it was five miles from our main clinic. And we used to make fun of him and say, Oh, you know, he's practicing black magic and voodoo down there in that building. And then we moved in. And then what happens? I become this holistic veterinarian doing all these things. And my business partner after about 10 years said, I think it's time for us to part ways. Cause you're doing some sort of voodoo that I don't understand. <laughs> And I was like, great, fine. <laughs> so I bought him out. But, you know, he was like, there's something about the building. It just <laughs> it just makes you want to do that. I was, The building was an old barn. <laughs> I was going to ask you what it was. Like, what was the, the conduit that led you down the holistic <sighs> path? But apparently it was a building. <laughs> I, I, apparently it was a building. No, it really was. Um, I accidentally took a chiropractic course. It was called something else. And so I didn't know what it was. And I showed up and I about three hours in, I was like, 
I think this guy's talking about chiropractic. I don't even think I believe in this. And so it was just really weird. And of course, we'd already paid for it and I was already there. So I stuck it out until the course was over. Um, you know, it, it was it was an involved course. So I was like, well, I'm already here. And then uh, after I learned it, I went back to the office and started using it. And I went, oh my gosh, this is so cool. And so then I was like, well, if this does this much, what else is there? Like, what else could I learn? And so then, you know, I started talking to clients about it, especially the ones that were coming in for chiropractic. They tended to be more leaning toward holistic stuff. And so people started coming in with all kinds of weird things. Like I had this lady came in with these Japanese raindrop cards. And so the crystals of each raindrop or each snowflake or each water drop, whatever, they're all different. And so she had these decks of cards and she was using those to figure out where her animal had pain. And, this, and I was just like, okay. <laughs> but then I just started looking at everything, everything. And so I started studying homeopathy and I was like, this is not for me. I no. Um, and I looked at a lot of different things, essential oils, uh, light therapy, color therapy. And then when I took my first acupuncture course, I was like, oh, this is cool. And kind of went from there. So <laughs> That's fun, though, especially if it's by accident. By accident. Nothing's by accident. Oh, yeah. The universe was like, here you go. Yeah. The universe just threw that in front of me and said, here, do with this what you will. And I was kind of, and that's actually my, my entire career, uh, even where I am now with Naturally Healthy Pets, it, it literally was a series of accidents accidents, fate, a series of things thrown in my path. And when they're thrown there, you make a decision, uh, run the other way, step into it, step over it. <laughs> so, and some things I've been really, really, really resistant. And I, you know, it's like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Okay. I'm going to do that. Yeah. Well, and I, I want to talk <laughs> about food therapy some more, but before we do, I do like to try to, to throw in some more little personal things here and there. And um, since you brought up Naturally Healthy Pets and your beautiful daughter, Gwen, um, was kind enough to come on the podcast last year. Um, so we, yeah. we learned a little bit about, uh, she, she helped us figure out social media a little bit because <laughs> that's a tricky, tricky Yay. place. Tricky, tricky place. <laughs> She's very good at it. She is, isn't she? Um, you recently moved, I say recently, in the past couple of years, moved. Mm -hmm. You were in where, New Jersey and came down to- I was in New Jersey. I'm a, I'm a Jersey girl, born and bred, uh, lived there most of my life. I went to veterinary school in Illinois, so I had to had to leave the state for four years um, and kept coming back. And we lived in southern New Jersey, which is all farmland. Most people think of New Jersey as kind of the armpit of New York and factories and stuff. We were at the other end of the state, which is all farmland and uh, actually has the longest- continuously running rodeo in the country. It was two miles from our house. So there was a tidbit. <laughs> Who would think New Jersey? Uh, but it is. And um, then Gwen, uh, she got married and she called me and said that she was expecting her first child. And I said, oh, time to retire and move to North Carolina. And that's how we ended up in North Carolina. <laughs> And you have a big, beautiful farm now in North Carolina with we do. so many animals. Tell me, how many animals do you have right now? It's over 50, um, but 20 some of those are chickens. Okay. So I don't know if that counts. We have a bunch of roosters. We accidentally got a bunch of roosters. We wanted hens, but eh, now we have a lot of roosters. Uh, we have some goats. We have donkeys. We have a mule. We have miniature horses, miniature mules, a draft horse, five dogs, nine cats. I don't know. It's a, it's a zoo. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. And they're all rescues. Yeah. They're, they're uh, most of the farm animals were rescued from the kill pen. And, uh, well, the chickens we bought to be chickens, we, we need fresh eggs. <laughs> right. You do though with, with the roosters that probably creates a little, of uh, that's been fun. Um, the they came and we bought a dozen chicks, and seven out of the twelve ended up being roosters, which is not good. And my mom, who is four foot nine, and she's eighty six, she feeds the chickens and the cats. And so these roosters started attacking her because they're almost as big as she is. And uh, so the three meanest ones went to live at Gwen's house, and her boyfriend now uh, takes care of the roosters and does incredibly funny videos and reels with these roosters and the three goats that live at their house. They live next door. Um, 
but we still have four roosters <laughs> at our house. So. Wow. Yeah, that has to be. You know, I, I actually, I love them because I love hearing the roosters crowing. And we didn't have that before. But I will tell you, they don't crow when the sun comes up. Those stinkers crow all night long. <laughs> Oh, wow. I, I always, you know, as a child, you learn roosters crow when the sun comes up and it's time to get up. No, they crow at two and three o'clock in the morning. I don't know what they're screaming about, but they are. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's, in, I have not heard that. That's very interesting. I wonder what that's all about. <laughs> I have no idea, but that's what they do. But I, I actually enjoy them. So. And you're uh, very famously, uh, your dogs are all. Cavaliers. Yes, the king. Actually, we started with a bunch of Cavaliers. Okay. Actually, I started with, uh, Gwen got a Cavalier and I got English Toy Spaniels. And then we had a whole bunch of Cavaliers. And now, weirdly, we only have one Cavalier, three English Toy Spaniels, which is the Cavaliers are the King Charles and the uh, English Toys are the Prince Charles. Okay. Um, and then we have we have an accidental one Cocker Spaniel. An accidental <laughs> Okay. I have actually only ever, and this is going to sound crazy. Um, I've only ever met like in person, one Cocker Spaniel in my life. My aunt and uncle had one and his eyes would like literally fall out of his head. It was oh, the craziest yeah. thing. I was a kid. I was a little kid and I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> it was well, ours is pretty much blind, so he's kind of a pain in our butt, but um, he's blind and toy obsessed, so he steals all my granddaughter's toys, he steals pillows, he steals everything. <laughs> well, it's kind of a pain. <laughs> good good content, right? Um, yep, right. <laughs> okay, so if we can switch gears a little bit back to food sure. therapy. So... We can actually use food not just as fuel for the body, but as medicine in a way. Can you Absolutely. speak to that some? Absolutely. So I would say that 80 to 90% of the healing that I got with my patients was done through food. Choosing the right ingredients to feed the problem. So everything that we eat or that we feed to our pets, whether it's an herb or a vegetable or a, a meat product, whatever it is, is going to have certain effects on the body. So let's see if we can think of a couple of things. Um, so if you have fluid buildup in your body, you might go to the doctor and be given a diuretic. So a pill like Lasix or something like that. Well, you also could eat certain foods that would make you get rid of that dampness or fluid that's built up in your body. So dandelion happens to be an excellent one. And when my kids were like preteens, I took them to Europe and we went on a bus tour with a bunch of old people. And my kids were the only kids. It was pretty funny. All the, all the people treated them like they, she had, they had a million grandparents. But everybody's ankles were swelling from sitting on, you know, planes, trains, and automobiles. And so I went to a local English pharmacy in England, and I said, I need something for swollen ankles. And they handed me dandelion root capsules. And I was like, okay, now, this is before I was doing all this stuff. And so I took my little capsules and my ankles immediately went down. And so of course, everybody else on the bus is like, where do we get those? And I was just handing out dandelion. So, you know, that was before I was even into food therapy. But so would you rather take a pharmaceutical pill or would you rather eat some dandelion greens in your salad or, you know, take a, a powder or a capsule? So that's where we're getting kind of into herbal therapy a little bit, but you can use the whole foods as well. So a lot of animals have elevated liver enzymes. Well, that's just swelling in the liver. And there are a lot of things that we can use to drain the liver. So I can take an animal with elevated liver enzymes and I can make a diet for them that will bring those enzymes down without having to go on a bunch of drugs. Uh, a lot of people will use milk thistle. Well, that's really food therapy. It's an herb. Um, it's a beautiful plant, by the way, but it's very spiky. Um, so th that's something that we can incorporate in the diet. 
food has a lot of different properties. It can drain damp. It can drain that fluid. It can move stagnation. So for an animal that's in heart failure where the blood is pooling and it's stagnating and it's not moving through the body, we add something called a chi tonic, which is an energy tonic. So energy is going to get things moving and get things flowing. Turmeric. It's a wonderful product to get that going, but we also, certain meats are going to be better chi tonics than others. Think of how a rabbit moves. It's very fast. It zips around. That's a great chi tonic. You just watch how it moves. You're like, oh, look at that. There's a lot of energy in there. So rabbit is a great chi tonic. So we can categorize foods. Um, so animals who are anemic or their body is too dry, that's a blood deficiency. So we may see it in lab work as a low red blood cell count, but we may have a normal red blood cell count, but yet we've got an animal with a dry coat, dry, crusty pads, dry, crusty nose, maybe a little bit of dry eye. Well, that's a moisture deficiency. Okay, great. What foods supply blood and moisture to the body? Egg yolks, amazing. Liver, amazing. Um, dark leafy greens are also very good. Uh, sardines, oily fish are going to be really good for those sorts of things. So we can take any problem that an animal or a human is having, and we can design a diet using foods to move stagnation, uh, dissolve phlegm. So um, with respiratory infections and you're coughing up a bunch of phlegm or you've got this thick discharge from your nose. You can eat clams, you can eat pears, and that's going to dissolve the phlegm. So I absolutely loved food therapy so much in my practice that um, when people would come in and we'd go through the whole analysis of their pet, and then I'd say, oh, geez, well, we've got a chi, chi deficiency and a yin deficiency and a blood deficiency. Okay, we've got a put something together to to make a diet that's going to solve all these issues. Well, it was taking me so long to do that every time somebody came in that I actually have written a couple of cookbooks for dogs, not for cats, but uh, cookbooks for dogs that have diets to address all these things. And then my life became so much easier because people would come in and I would just take the book and earmark the pages and say, this one, this one, and this one. And it was just a lot easier than having to design new diets every time somebody came in. Um, so that is the power of food. We also, so if you have an animal who is hot and panting all the time, those dogs with Cushing's disease, they're hot, they're dry. We need to give them foods that are going to energetically cool them. So think about hot summer days. What do we eat? We eat things like watermelon. We eat things like ice cream. We eat things that are energetically from the inside going to cool us. You also could eat something spicy. Works better for people than it does for uh, pets. But if, for instance, if we ate in the hot summer, if we ate a spicy curry dish, it would make us sweat because that is energetically warming to the body. But when you eat a hot pepper and you sweat, sweat is perspiring is how people cool off. So it doesn't work as well on our pets because they don't perspire. Uh, but when that moisture film forms on the outside of our body because we're perspiring, as it dries, it actually cools the body. So I wouldn't use spicy foods for our pets to cool them, but we do have a lot of different things that are very cooling. Um, we don't usually use ice cream, but we can use watermelon. We can use cucumbers. We can use cooling meats. So like uh, deep water fish, uh, wild caught deep water fish is usually going to be cooling. Um, lamb, elk, venison are very warming. So if we have a cold dog or it's the middle of winter and we want to energetically warm them up, then we're going to choose from that category. So all of these foods are, or all these categories, we have lists in TCM or TCVM because it goes across all species. We have lists of foods that are warming, that are cooling, that are blood tonics, that are chi tonics, that dissolve phlegm, that resolve stagnation. And so you look at the lists and you say, okay, well, I've got to fix this. I've got to fix this. I've got to fix this. What's in those categories and how can I combine them to make a meal for my pet that is really going to be medicinal for them? And if the food by itself is not enough to solve the problem, that's when we add in the herbs. So we're just adding really a concentrated form of the food. It's fascinating. And also, again, even with herbs, which we love, 
it's still the food is the foundation. We have to get the food right. Yeah, absolutely. And before we yep. can start adding other yeah. things in, and I think that is something um, you've touched on that a couple of times, but also can't be said enough and can't be talked about enough is that, like you said at the beginning, you cannot out supplement a bad diet. So we have to have to have to get the food right, right first. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. So, and sometimes I see animals that are being fed absolutely the opposite of what they need. Um, I'll never forget. I have a client in upstate New York. She had a Pomeranian that uh, was having all kinds of reflux and just all kinds of GI issues. And I can't remember which direction we had to send the dog, whether it was too hot or too cold. Uh, but by the time we were done with the consultation, it was like, you're feeding the exact opposite of what this dog needs. And when she changed it, all of the symptoms disappeared. Um, so, you know, a lot of times it's, it's just, so my office manager, when I was very, very early in this, before I was really into the raw feeding and stuff, uh, she was feeding, she had a new beagle puppy. He was like 12, 13 weeks old. And she'd had him for quite a while. And he was just untrainable crazy nuts, bouncing, like, like an ADD kid. I mean, just untrainable, couldn't get him house trained, couldn't teach him to do anything. She's like, he's just nuts all the time. And at the time she was feeding a lamb and rice kibble. Well, lamb is very hot. White rice is very hot. And I said, you know, I think this would be a good experiment for food therapy because literally this dog is on fire and you're throwing paper on his fire. You're just fueling that fire because he's already energetically hot and all over the place. And we're adding to that. So I literally just had her switch the kibble because this was when we were in the old days when we were still saying kibble was okay. Um, we switched it to an energetically cooling protein in the kibble. And within three weeks, the dog was a different dog, it was house trained. I mean, and yes, it got, it was growing up a little bit, but it was just a huge change in the ability for the dog to focus and learn and do what needed to be done. So that was really early when I was first dabbling in food therapy. So it's probably 20 years ago. Um, and, you know, just little things like that, that just made such huge differences. And then, you know, moving forward, fast forward another 10, 12 years, uh, formulating diets and really understanding the importance of human grade ingredients, real food, whole food, whether you're feeding it gently cooked or raw. I really don't care. I'm a huge raw feeding fan, but not all people and not all dogs are going to do well on raw food. Some some do better on gently cooked. It just depends what the issues are that are going on. So I'm not against it. Um, but th we can just see huge, huge differences. I had a, um, again, very early on, I had a client that came in with a fairly old dog with cancer that was obese and it was down and the dog couldn't get up and they weren't ready to put the dog down. And, um, the dog still, you know, attitude wise was very good, but she was obese and she couldn't get up and she wasn't eating well and she just felt awful. And I said, well, what if we, design a diet? Are you willing to cook food for this dog and get the, you know, the dog just wouldn't touch the kibble anymore. And they were like, yeah, we'll do anything you tell us to do, doc. I said, okay. So we designed a diet for the dog based on the symptoms and problems that the dog had. And, uh, about three months later they came in and the dog was doing great. She was up, she had lost weight. She was very mobile, feeling much better, still had cancer. And uh, I said, so how's it all going for you? <laughs> it looks like it's going okay. And they said, this has been the best three months of our dog's life. We totally changed everything. And the thing is, they were empowered because they had the power to make a difference. And they saw the difference. And the dog, even though that was the last chapter of the dog's life, they felt, and the dog <laughs> still had cancer, they felt it was the best chapter of the dog's life. So that's how powerful it can be. And when we get our pets off these high carb diets, if they're overweight, the weight comes off. You don't have to starve them. You don't have to put them on a diet. All you have to do is feed the appropriate number of calories that are not starchy and they'll lose the weight and become more mobile and have less inflammation and you know, everything just gets better. So that's the power of it. And uh, for me, it, it was the most 
incredible part of practice for me was seeing the transformation in the animals just by changing their food and making their food specific for what they needed. Yeah. And I appreciate so much that you mentioned how empowering it is, whether that's cooking for your dog or just becoming aware of the food that you're feeding and putting more intention into the food that you're feeding. That is very empowering. And it reminds me of... And you don't have to make your own. There are so many companies out there now that are making really good food. I have a a line of food that's out that is actually based on TCVM. It's called Constitutions. So we have diets for each one of the elements. And uh, we actually have a pet personality quiz. We have a human one, too. If you want to find out which Chinese element you are, you learn a lot about yourself when you know what your element is and you know why you do things the way you do. I'm a wood personality. Anybody who does TCVM, you'll know that I can get really cranky because I'm a wood. (laughs) But, you know, when you know the personality of your dog, you know where issues are going to show up as well. When you know what their element is, uh, because each element is ruled by different organ systems. So wood is ruled by the liver and the gallbladder. So if, if I don't take care of keeping that in balance, that's where problems are going to show up for me. And I know that, and I know where my animals' problems are going to show up if I don't keep them in balance. I'm glad you said that because that was actually where I was going was with the um, constitutions (laughs) and figuring out the uh, personality, the TCB and personality of your pet. So I will make sure to put the link in the show notes where people can go and take that little quiz to find that out. Yeah, it's really, it's actually really fun. Um, it can, it can be a fun party game that, to download the human one and, you know, sit around the table with your family and figure out who everybody is. And then you'll find out why you get along or don't get along. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, we actually did that in our office one day. We sat with all the employees and everybody had to take the quiz and uh, figure out what they were. It was really fun. I bet it was <laughs> so interesting. It's like, that's why you do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> and so you brought up cooked food and raw food, and there is some debate, I guess, that does go on. There's a lot of debate. <laughs> as to if feeding a raw food diet to your pet is in line with TCVM principles. What do you think? So it is, uh, but here's the the kicker. So from a TCVM standpoint, like if we, uh, so the earth element is the element that controls digestion. So the organs associated with it are stomach and spleen and spleen in Chinese medicine is digestive element. It's not that little brown thing that we think about in uh, Western spleen. So it's your digestive system and the digestive system from a Chinese, the earth element does not like cold and it does not like damp. So from that standpoint, you might say, well, hey, dry kibble is nice and dry. There's no dampness there. And it's energetically hot, so it's not cold, except that it's highly processed and the digestive system absolutely hates it, by the way. So But when we feed a raw food, well, there's a lot of moisture there. There's a lot of dampness. But what we discover is that when we feed a raw or a gently cooked food, it's going to retain all the moisture. What happens is your pet no longer is standing at the water bowl for an hour a day. They just quit drinking because they're getting all their moisture in their food. If you think about what they would eat if they, let's say your dog went out and took down a deer and ate it raw, it's high moisture. They're getting all that moisture. That's what they're meant to eat. So that is the appropriate amount of moisture to be in the diet. What happens is they just don't have to go drink a whole bunch of water because they don't have to rehydrate that dry product that only had 6% moisture. They just ate something that had 75% moisture, which is what they're supposed to take in, which enhances the digestive process. The cold part is an issue. So um, when you go to Europe or you go to Eastern countries, they don't put ice in their drinks. They drink their beer warm 
everything is served at room temperature because that is better for digestion. So this is an American thing where we put ice in all of our drinks and all of our, you know, our beer is cold and, and we eat all these cold things, which is not good for your digestive system. Now that doesn't mean like my dogs, uh, I make frozen treats for them. Well, that's a treat that they get one or two little tiny frozen treats a day, uh, which they really look forward to. That's not going to be a problem for their digestive system. If I were to feed them frozen food at a frozen temperature, that would be a problem for them. So if you are feeding raw food, the most important part of feeding that food is feeding it at room temperature up to body temperature. So somewhere between 72 and 102 degrees is where that food needs to be. So you, you know, and for a lot of people that feed raw get a little wigged out. You know, most raw feeders are like, oh, I don't care about the bacteria. The bacteria is not an issue. My dog's going to handle it. Um, but there are some people who are like, ah, oh my gosh, you know, I can't leave it sitting out on the counter. It'll grow all kinds of things. Um, I will leave food sitting out on the counter to come to room temperature. I have no problem with that. Uh, it's never been a problem for my dogs uh, or my cats. But you can take the food and you can add some really hot water to it to bring it up to room temperature if you're just taking it out of the refrigerator. If they don't like it soupy, uh, then you can take the food in a bowl or a bag and sit that in a bowl of hot water to just let it bring itself up to room temperature. So as long as you're feeding things at, in that 70 to 100 degree range, the digestive system is going to be like, okay, good. It's, if you think about what our pets would eat, let's say they went out and took down a deer, they're eating it at body temperature. Mm -hmm. And if they go back and eat it the next day, which sometimes they will do, um, you know, it's whatever the air temperature is. So uh, it is not good to feed raw food or leftover food and home cooked food, anything straight out of the refrigerator. You don't want to feed it cold. So what I, what I feel is that raw food falls within the parameters of TCVM very easily as long as we are feeding it at that warmer temperature. And it's the, the absolute normal amount of moisture that we would want in our pet's food. They just drink less. Yeah. I actually was uh, scrolling through TikTok the other day and this girl was feeding her dogs raw food. And they were literal bricks frozen out of the freezer and handing frozen. it to these giant dogs. And I was like, Aw. Yeah, not so good. <laughs> like, thank you. First of all, thank you for feeding, a, a, you know, a biologically appropriate food. A but, raw food? Oh, these poor babies. <laughs> Well, it's funny because one time our um, our power was out and I couldn't get hot water or anything. And so I had to take frozen food out of the freezer. We were without power for five days. And so I had to take frozen food out of the freezer to feed my dogs. And I'm like, sorry, guys, it's frozen. They literally were like, we're not touching that until it falls out. Like They didn't even know what to do with it. So uh, kind of interesting. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't think mine would either. She's so picky and finicky and she... <laughs> <laughs> mine aren't picky but they were just like we don't know what to do with this <laughs> oh my goodness no. and and actually when i when i when i first started feeding raw food i bought raw food for my cats as well and it was these little tiny round mm -hmm. frozen things and so i put one on the floor for them to just you know kind of look at and sniff and play with and they literally played with it like a hockey puck i was like okay well, <laughs> that's not gonna work <laughs> Well, I mean, that's what they would do with like a lizard or something. Maybe, maybe they would have gotten there. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're fine now that we warm it up. They're like, okay, yeah, this is good stuff. But, you know, we definitely want it warm. Yes. <laughs> Interestingly, that is how I, and I don't know why I didn't think of it. I had a friend tell me even the um, like rehydrated freeze dried for my cats. I, I literally have to like heat the bone broth on the stove and pour it over the freeze dried so that it really, it's like really, really warm. I mean, I, I don't give it to them boiling, yep. but like cats, cats are, cats are much pickier and they definitely want their food at mm -hmm. body temperature. I mean, if you think about I, half of my cats 
the majority of my cats are, are, are barn cats. Um, so they catch a lot of mice, they catch a lot of birds, but they don't catch the mouse and let it lay around for a day or two. They catch it and they eat it at body temperature. Um, so cats really like their food fresh and they like their food mm-hmm. warm. Do they? I'm curious. Cats hate leftovers. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. So <laughs> when I used to live out in the country, my I had some outdoor cat, some, a feral cat colony, and they would catch all the mice um, from the fields when they would plow the fields. And I would literally like walk outside and the driveway would, would just be like mice heads scattered because they would eat the whole body and leave the heads. <laughs> do your cats do the same thing? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes they eat yeah. all of it. Sometimes they leave me heads. Uh, and with the birds, usually all I find is a couple of feathers. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, there was, there was a bird. A, there was a bird at one they're time. Kind of amazing. <laughs> there was a bird. Yes. Yeah. They're, they're pretty good at keeping things under control. They, they are. <laughs> they're, uh, they actually, one of their, fa- one of their favorite foods is actually grasshoppers. Mm-hmm. They literally will leap in the air and grab hot grasshoppers out of the air and then they eat them, which I'm blown away by that because now, you know, we're seeing all these novel proteins coming on the market, uh, cricket being a big one. Um, and they're talking about using black fly larvae and, you know, just all kinds of new novel proteins. Personally, I, I feel like we need a lot more research into how that is going to act nutritionally for our pets before we start jumping on this bandwagon. But I will say my cats eat a lot of grasshoppers. <laughs> so maybe there's something to it. Yeah, I maybe I, I've, I saw a bunch of that too at um, super zoo. And then there was, there was one at AHVMA, mm-hmm. I think that was maybe cricket protein. Anyway. It may have been. Yeah. Yeah. The cricket protein people are kind of getting. Well yeah. <laughs> It's a, it's very weird to me, and I'm not jumping on that bandwagon. I you get you're going to have to show me a lot of research on the nutritional. Diet. Yeah. Long long term studies with dogs eating that before I will jump on that bandwagon. Well, I think <laughs> that's pretty good information, and um, especially with food therapy, I know um, with the the Constitution diets that you have through All Provide are available for people again just to reiterate take the test yeah Yeah, right now uh they are available at allprovide.com and they ship direct to consumer uh they actually are going to be announcing at global for them to be available in retail pet stores as well so uh small pet stores independent pet stores that are carrying uh the regular all provide or my pup loaf will then be able to carry constitutions if they want to. The thing with constitutions is, and all of the, all five of the diets are complete and balanced for adult dogs. Um, and you could feed any of them to any dog. You're not going to do any damage, but if you take the pet personality quiz and you decide, oh, this is what my dog really needs to get something back in balance, it's just going to be more powerful uh, to to pick and choose and say, well, this is made specifically to deal with this issue that the dog is having or to keep him in balance because this is his element. Um, so they can be fed to any dogs, but they are more powerful if you are using them according to uh, what you figure out with the pet personality quiz. So it's, it's, and it's kind of fun. It is fun. <laughs> At least for me, cause I'm, I'm a food yeah, nerd. <laughs> right. No, I think it is really fun. Um, and just so we don't forget, I know we're, we're ahead of the curve here, but um, tickets are on sale for your blowout event of the year in October. And tickets are going I've fast, uh, particularly the VIP tickets. The VIP tickets are, they're not going to last. It's funny. My sister uh, messaged me and she said, I don't know what my schedule is going to be in October. I might have some events I have to go to. Uh, is it okay to wait and buy my ticket? And I know she wants a VIP. And I said, if you wait more than about 10 more days, you're not going to get a VIP ticket. And if you buy one and find out that you can't go, I guarantee you'll be able to resell it because they're a hot item. I know. Well, <laughs> yeah. Hot. I mean, I think people <laughs> kind of got used to you traveling a little bit over the last year or so. And then it's like, nope, we're doing one event, which is wonderful for you, right? We're doing one biggie. <laughs> 
Well, it's one, you know, this is our, we kind of wanted to put all our eggs in one basket because it's very expensive to put on an event this size. So we didn't want to spread it out over a bunch of small events. We wanted to do one big blowout and the six international speakers that we're bringing in have never been in the same room before altogether. Uh, I don't know if they ever will be again, but we literally picked the best of the best to come in for this event. And uh, I think it's, I, I can't wait. I, I can't wait to be in the same room with all these people. Uh, I've met all but one of them in person. I have not met Nick Thompson in person from England. I've done so many broadcasts with him, and I feel like he's one of my best buddies, but we haven't met in person. So I'm really excited to have everybody together. I think it's going to be really, really fun. I think so, too. I'm really looking forward to it. So, yeah, if you want a VIP ticket, check it out awesome. right now. <laughs> check it out because they are going fast. Uh, I, you know, general admission, we'll have those around for a little bit, I think, but, um, VIPs, man, because the VIPs get to go to the cocktail hour with all the speakers and get special time with the, the speakers and, you know, preferred seating and better goodie bags. And, uh, we'll have 50 vendors, but they are all completely handpicked by us. And we have had many companies reach out to us that did not fit our criteria. And so you know that if there's a company there, they were completely vetted by us and uh, met the criteria too. Because we probably could sell 200 vendor spots if we just wanted to open it up to anybody, but uh, we have room for 50. And so we're being very picky, but it means that your shopping experience is going to be really awesome as well. Absolutely. And also why your online store is so valuable because it is all vetted by you. <laughs> So, you know, if you're going there, it's not like, yep. <laughs> I wonder what I'm getting. Well, it's funny because um, one product that we have really liked, we found out now they're getting their funding from Hills and Cargill. And so we said, we can't do that anymore. And another company reached out to us. They have a really cool product that, you know, I think is very exciting, but their funding is coming from Mars. And, um, you know, we just, we can't unless these companies are willing to straighten out what they're doing with pet food, we cannot be associated with, you know, that's great that they want to put money behind some really new and innovative things, but they're not willing to put money behind cleaning up the food. And so it just doesn't align with. Right. With us. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's valuable um, as a, a pet parent consumer because you know, the average person, they, they work a job. They're just trying to do the best for their pets that they can. And they don't have time to put all of this yep. research into every single thing. So exactly. having having that is, is very valuable and uh, <laughs> very appreciated. And thank you so much for being here and thank talking you. about <laughs> thank you. traditional Chinese medicine, veterinary medicine, and um, kind of maybe demystifying <laughs> it a little bit for people, especially the... Hopefully, but there's tons, tons more information in my books and uh, on our website with that. And we actually have a course on TCVM nutrition. It's actually a two part. There's a 101 and a 102. Uh, so for people who really want to dive into it and learn a lot more about it, uh, the course is actually the lectures that I gave at the Holistic Veterinary Association. So the, the, the course is pretty in-depth because it's what I was teaching veterinarians and we're making it available to pet parents so that they can learn That's the fantastic. Thing. Thank you for mentioning that. And I will make sure everything we talked about is linked in the show notes for you as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Judy. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training the Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, oh, oh.